we say, okay, this, this is going to be the tenors, this part will be for the sopranos, this part will be for the bass. And, I, and so, I, and I don't know, I didn't know anything about any of those. I said, I said, honey, which one am I? She's like, sweetie, we haven't figured that out yet. She, <laughs> she goes, you just kind of, you just, she goes, you just hum along, it'll be fine. <laughs> and I started cracking up. All right, so today we're going to be in uh, the Life of Christ Challenge, Lesson 5. So as we get to uh, Lesson 5, let's open our Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 1, and uh, we'll, we'll basically basically be covering in this uh, first section, uh, or in this section today, uh, Luke chapter 1, verse uh, 5 through 58. So go ahead and open your Bibles there, and as, as way of uh, introduction here, uh, just a brief re recap. What, what have we discussed up to this point so far? Well, so far we've looked at uh, the intended audiences for the different gospel accounts, uh, and I know we have a couple people in here that haven't been here for the full Life of Christ Challenge that we started, I don't even know what, five, six, seven weeks ago. I don't even know how long it's been now. Uh, but try, give, try like three. Three? No, it's like been three. longer than three weeks. Four, maybe. Okay. It's less than five for at least five Yeah, yeah. It's, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> As you well, get older, the older, time slows six, down. Six because we haven't done a full yeah. lesson every week. Because some of the weeks were multiple, uh, some of the classes were multiple weeks. But regardless, regardless, not, let's not get off topic. You, you can actually go actually onto our uh, Lincoln Park uh, Church of Christ YouTube page. And for those of you that are newer to this class, you'll be able to then go back and relook at those lessons to catch yourself up if that is your desire. So, so far we've looked at the intended audiences for the different gospel accounts. So far we've looked at the, the, uh, the world uh, and the way things were before Jesus' birth, okay, and what they were like, what the world was like after his birth. When he, Jesus came into this world, when he started his ministry at the age of 30, we've looked at some of those things. Uh, we've also looked at genealogies for, uh, and, uh, for the Matthew uh, in Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3. And we looked at the gospel introductions uh, uh, for uh, uh, Matthew, Mark, or Matthew, Luke, and John. And so in today's lesson, we're going to start to discuss uh, the events that were leading up to two very important births. And who are those two very important births that you think I'm talking about? John the Baptist, John the Baptist and Jesus. the obvious one, Jesus. Jesus, the Lord, right? And so today we're going to get into that. We're going to start to talk a little bit about that. But before we do, a quick uh, little uh, trivia question for you. Which of these five people that I'm about to name would be considered the greatest? Zacharias, Elizabeth, John, Mary, or Joseph? I heard Mary. What else? John. What else? Anybody? Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Okay. How would we find the answer to that? Oh, well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> well, in Scripture, in Matthew chapter 11, you don't have to turn there because I already have your Bibles open to Luke chapter 1. But in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 11, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, among these born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than, not Mary, not, Je uh, not uh, Zacharias or Elizabeth, but John. There has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, and yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So, Steve, are you ready? Steve's going to uh, pick up uh, on point one. And if you look on the screen behind me, I'll also have some, we'll have some slides that will go along with this. Okay. Uh, if you're open to Luke 1, we're going to start at uh, verse 5. We're going to be covering verses 5 through 25, and my voice is a little weak, <clears throat> so I'd like somebody with a strong voice, Steve, <clears throat> if you would. I'll would read, let me read that since we have oh, a microphone. All right, read that. That way please. everybody will hear it well, plus the people at home as well. So let me get to it. Luke 1, starting in verse 5, tells us, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the customs of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at that hour of the incense offering. 
Bless you. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right side of the altar of incense. Zacharias, he was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear us bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness. Oh, one second, as I'm moving my clicker here. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will uh, drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will, he will turn many of the sons of Israel back uh, to their Lord God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the, and the disobedient to the attitude of righteous, uh, to the righteous so as to, make, uh, to, as to make ready a people prepared from the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this for certain? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. The angel said and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. We're going through 25? Yes. Okay. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. The people were waiting for Zacharias and, and were wondering at his delay in the temple. But when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. When the days of his priestly service were ended, he went back home. After these days, Elizabeth, his wife, became pregnant. And she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, This is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor upon me to take away my disgrace among men. I want you to remember... Zacharias' response and reaction to the angel. Because I think it's very important how this man, who has at different times stepped into the most holy place and offered sacrifice or incense on the altar, has the opportunity to do these acts of holy worship responds to the presence of an angel. And I'll have another reaction later on. But Zacharias lived in Palestine, which was southwest of Jerusalem. And as we've mentioned, he was a priest. And it's key that he and his wife were both descendants of Aaron because he had to be a descendant of Aaron to be a priest. This was by law. And they were divided. The priests were divided into 24 divisions. That was the, the way that the, they were divided into. And he was a division of Abijah. Now, they took turns working in the temple one week at a time, each of the divisions. It just so happened that he drew the lot to go in and offer the incense at this time. Now, this was the most prestigious act that he could, that the priest could do, was to go in and burn the incense. That was something that they took great pride, and it was prestigious for them to go in and be able to do this. Uh, it was a, an act that, if nothing else, it gave him the ability to uh, say that he'd done it. I don't know many, how many times before this he may have done it probably many times during his lifetime as a priest, he had made that, had that opportunity. Let me pause right there for a second. So when we think about uh, these tasks, right? Mm -hmm. um, when we think about the priesthood, 
Uh, if you go back, and you don't have to turn your Bibles there, but Exodus chapter 28, verse 1. That is when we know that, uh, that Aaron, uh, all descendants, all the, the priests were to be descendants of Aaron. So we learn about that in Exodus chapter 28. But we also learn in 1 Chronicles chapter 24 is where we learn of these 24 divisions, right? Uh, uh, Aaron had four sons, uh, were priests. Uh, two of the sons died. And so then uh, out of their sons um, then came uh, who were had, four, they had four sons. And then it was from those, descendants of those, that make up the 24 divisions of the priesthood. Uh, there was lots that were, drawing, uh, that were drawn to choose each, each and every one of them. But the actual, the most coveted uh, task, which Steve was mentioning, was offering incense on the altar. But this is something that didn't, wouldn't have come about, uh, uh, you know, maybe once in a lifetime, actually. Uh, because of the way, because of the 24 divisions, and out of those 24 divisions, each division had a certain number of priests. And they would draw lots to determine whose responsibility, who, who was responsible to do what as far as the work of the temple. And so during that time, um, he was happened to be chosen. But it was something that to, to receive that, uh, to have your lot drawn, um, it, it would have been something that was very rare, actually. Uh, and so not only was it very rare, uh, but it was, it was probably considered the, the greatest honor that any normal priest could actually do. Because the normal priest couldn't go into the most holy of holies, amen? <coughs> what would happen if a normal priest went into the most holy of holies? Mm, gone. He'd He'd die. Die. He's dead. He would die. <coughs> and so anybody who was not the high priest who would go into the most holy of holies uh, would have died. And so this altar is literally right before the curtain that separates that altar from the most holy of holies. So it was a great honor for a normal, everyday lay priest, if you will, uh, to go and to have the opportunity to offer that incense. Go ahead. Um, now, the angel that appeared to him, appeared to, to Zacharias, was Gabriel. And as Gabriel mentioned, he said, I stand before God. So you can trust what I have to say. If I get my... I, my message is not my words, but the words of God. So if you don't trust what I have to say, you're not trusting the words of God. So. What was it that, what was it that uh, John, or that Zacharias said that showed that he didn't necessarily believe and trust? What was, what was it that he said? Well, he said, how do I know if right. you're from God? And I'm like, all I can think in my head is like, it's an angel, you goofball. What do you mean that you know it's from God? Yeah. <coughs> it's more than one time in the Bible where they yeah. see an angel and they're like, well, how do I know it's from God? Yeah. And so and it's not necessarily that I know how it is from God, Gina. I got yeah. so sad because he was old. Because he is old. Yeah. And, and so that he, he basically asked for proof. Right. And that's the key. That he asked for proof, right? Well, if an angel appeared from God... Think about the idea of an angel for a second. I'm going to turn it back over to Steve. If an angel appeared from God, did they, were they just bored one day and be like, I think I'm going to go talk to Zacharias. <laughs> I haven't seen my buddy in a while. I'm going to go down there and pop up in front of him and see how he's doing, see how his week's going. If, if an angel appeared before somebody, who sent him? God. God. And if God sent him, did they have the authority to not only say but do what God required of them? Mm -hmm. Because God gave them that power. Wait, one quick thing yeah, go ahead. about Gabriel. In that verse 19, the angel answered, I am. Come. Yeah. Gabriel. I am is representing who? God. God. That sometimes we never, when I, I've, I've been studying this about God and the names of God, but whenever we see that I am together, it is so significant. This is God speaking directly to you through me or through it. So even though it doesn't say I am, comma, Gabriel, I am is, 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 is implied that, hey, this is directly from God. I'm his servant. Mm -hmm. He could have said, hey, who are you, Gabriel? He could have just said, I, yeah. Gabriel, I, I am. I think we can't get the emphasis. We were talking about words on paper. You can't get yeah. the implication from what it really means. <laughs> and I know you yeah, what you're saying. The I am statement uh, goes all the way back to what? It you know, goes back to when God was having a conversation with Moses. Moses, right? right? Because he says, who will I tell the children of Israel I am? He I says, am. you tell them that I am sent you, right? Yeah. 
And so the I am here is different in the sense that he's, it's I am Gabriel. It's not I am comma yeah. Gabriel. Right. So, but we do know that he is God's representative. <coughs> matter, because when God sends Gabriel or Michael or Daniel or Ezekiel or any of his other messengers, they stand before you as God with the power of God in order to bring God's message with his full authority. So how do I know that? Because he had the ability to miraculously make him mute and said that you will be mute until something is fulfilled. Good. Um, I think one of the things that because Zechariah questioned, the, he said, my wife is old. I am old. He questions their ability. But in that statement, he questions God's ability. And because he does that, that's the question that he is, causes him to become mute. That's. Yes. 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 But so remember too, is this maybe a precursor to a lot of Israel? How much of Israel should have known about the prophecies? All of them. All of them. Right? I mean, were they not responsible to, uh, to especially the boys, understanding the law and knowing the law at a certain age, right? And so they should have known the law. They should have known the prophecies, the messianic prophecies. They should have known what they were looking for. Just like they should have known, this isn't the first time that God uh, had taken uh, somebody who was old, older or old, if you will, mm -hmm. and, uh, and had them conceived. So. But, but it was not necessarily, you know, the prophecies were there. But they weren't told how the prophecies were going to be fulfilled. And that's what they... God gave them the prophecy and wanted them to have the faith how the prop the to believe enough how the prophecies would be fulfilled. And the earlier statement you guys made uh, they made we come to worship every Sunday morning, go through the process, da 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 and all of a sudden one lesson is taught and boom the light comes on. Oh now Zachariah has been coming in and out, seeing all this everything for the last 50 years, whatever it was, and now he shows up and an angel appears. Boom! Things change. And that's how it is sometimes. Sometimes yeah. you sit in this pew for an Alfonso, for, he's not here this morning, is he? for a long time, and all of a sudden, boom! He becomes a Christian after 40 years or whatever. Yeah. It doesn't, we don't, just don't know, but we come <coughs> in anticipation. Amen. Mm. Um. When we get to the point in our lives where Lewis talks about the light bulb coming on, it's sometimes strange to us where uh, we read, we study, or we watch someone, and that person does, says, or reacts in a certain way that allows us to change our lives. And Zacharias, as we see later in our, our study here, is going to react in a way to allow others to change, I'm sure, in his response to what happens in the rest of his life. Um, but go ahead with okay. your work. So, a few more points, and then we're going to move on to the next uh, to the next parts. But so, as we look at this, let me make sure I'm on the right slide too. <coughs> All right, so we're still here. So, as as we look at this, a few more points uh, on what Steve's been talking about. So, the story is told of Zacharias. He was performing this task uh, in his week of service, and it says the angel appeared to him. But we know that the angel's name is Gabriel. 
<clears throat> what is the other angel that is named in scripture? Michael. 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 So we have Gabriel and Michael. We know, though, that the scriptures tell us that there are legions, right? Legions. And God can, God can have called legions of angels. Remember yeah. when he said, you know what I mean? If this was my kingdom, I could have called upon the Father and I would have been granted legions, right? We know that the angels, the spirit realm, is, is more than we could count. And yet, only Michael and Gabriel are the only two that actually are ever mentioned. And those angels are mentioned. Gabriel's mentioned, obviously, Luke 119 and 26 that we just seen. But he's also mentioned in Daniel chapter 8 in uh, Daniel chapter 9. Why is that significant? Because that's literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before we see Gabriel is mentioned in the book of Daniel. Michael, he's uh, mentioned in Jude uh, verse 9, Revelation chapter 12, as, long, as well as Daniel chapter 10 and Daniel chapter 12. But the distinction there <coughs> is that uh, Gabriel says, I am an angel who stands in the presence of God. And we know that uh, Michael is named as the archangel. What does that mean? He's number one. He's number one. He's kind of like the leader, right? He's the leader, so to speak, of the angels, right? But even Michael said that he would not uh, even dare to, uh, to, to make a condemning rebuke against who? Satan. Against Satan. It goes to show how powerful Satan must have been. And some people wonder if Satan may have been maybe Archangel. the original archangel, but then after he had fallen, uh, Michael had taken his place. Because from what we could tell and read in scripture, there was no angel bigger or stronger than Michael. Mm -hmm. Right? Go ahead. I was going to ask over there, Gabriel, when he silenced Zechariah, did, did he take it upon his own authority to do that? Or did no. That no God. An angel never ever works upon their own authority. And when they do, just like Satan and his, those who followed Satan, they were cast out of heaven. If an angel ever does anything outside of the authority of God, outside of the authority given to them by God, Rich. they will be pay, they will pay the price. Mm -hmm. Okay? So and so they will be cast out. God, God gives the angels certain leeway, certain uh, power, right? And he only used the power because they, uh, Zacharias, being a priest of God, he did what? He doubted God. How can this be? You know, what proof will you give me? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Since you want a little bit of proof, how about you're just going to be mute for the next nine months, and then uh, after the babies can, you know, after the baby comes about, then we'll uh, we'll lose your tongue for you. Is that proof enough for you? <laughs> and so I know I'm being facetious, right? But we think about this, right? What does the term angel mean? Messenger. It just means messenger, okay? Now think about it in another sense, right? A messenger who is sent out in whose authority? God's authority. You know, Jesus, he chose 12 individuals. In the beginning, 12 individuals. And what were they called? Apostles. Okay? And the apostles went out into the villages, right? Two by two, and as they went out, them and the disciples, whose authority did they uh, were, did they go under? Jesus. Jesus. They went under Jesus' authority. Who's Jesus? God. God. What did Jesus give them when he sent them out? Power to heal. heal. He gave them the power to do what? Heal. To heal, to cast out demons, <laughs> and to do all manner of things, right? So were they able to do anything in their own authority? No. no. Everything was from God. God had given them that ability. So we know that an apostle, just a messenger of God, sent out in his authority. We know that an angel is just a messenger of God sent out in his authority. And so when we look at these things, Gabriel told Zacharias that his wife Elizabeth would have a son. And this son would come in the spirit and the power of Elijah to be the, uh, to be the forerunner of the Messiah. Well, where does that idea come from? Well, the, the angel knew scripture. How would he know scripture? Because he's God's representative. And he was quoting Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5 and 6. If you go to the, uh, the, last, uh, the last prophetic book of the Old Testament, the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi 4, 5, and 6 says, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. And so we know that Zacharias struggled believing, and so the angel made him mute. 
as we learn about uh, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 20 because of his unbelief. But now we're going to transition to the next uh, topic here we're going to look at this morning. And that topic is on the announcement of Jesus. And so with this, we're going to read Luke chapter 1, and we're going to read in verse uh, 26 through 38. Luke chapter 1, 26 through 38. Notice what the scriptures tell us here. <clears throat> now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin enga engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement, and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, oops, sorry. and behold, you will uh, conceive and in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he, will, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am still a virgin? Now I want you to think about what Mary asks versus what Zechariah asks, and we'll examine that in a moment. So Mary said in verse 34 to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your uh, relative, Elizabeth, has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So we look at here, so we see the announcement of the birth of Christ. We see the announcement of the birth of John that we just looked at. And this first announcement uh, regarding John was made in the most sacred city in Palestine. <laughs> what was the most sacred city in Palestine? Bethlehem, right? Nazareth is what Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Right? Yeah. Jerusalem is mm -hmm. the most sacred uh, city in Palestine. And remember, what is another name for Palestine? that we talked about in previous weeks, Canaan, right? Palestine, Canaan, one and the same. And so we know that Jerusalem is the most, uh, the first announcement of John's birth was made in Jerusalem because it was made uh, there by the temple. We also know while the second announcement was made, uh, it was made in one of the most despised cities in Palestine. Where was Mary when, uh, when the angel appeared there? Do you guys remember? What city was she living in at the time? She was in Nazareth. And Nazareth was one of the most despised cities in Palestine. We know that the scriptures tell us that Mary and Joseph lived in Nazareth. But we also know that Nazareth was in the province of Galilee. And if you remember in our previous lessons, uh, probably, probably a couple, couple weeks ago I think I mentioned it, Galilee was actually looked down upon, the province of Galilee, by all of the Jews, by most of the Jews. And why was that? Do you remember what I said? Because Galilee was inhabited by both Jews, Jews and, and Gentiles. Gentiles. Did the Jews have a nice, warm, fuzzy relationship with the Gentiles? No. Did the Jews hate the Gentiles? Did they want to interact with the Gentiles? And yet we see that in Galilee, and especially Nazareth, where, uh, where Mary uh, was living at the time, uh, we know that, um, that there was, they cohabitated <coughs> with, uh, they lived amongst, uh, the Gentiles in that in that province in that area, and so we know that um, that Nazareth uh, was very it was almost tainted in the minds of the Jews. How do I know that? Because Josephus he mentions two hundred and four cities in his writings. As Josephus, if you were to go back and you were to study out all of his writings, he mentions two hundred and four cities. And guess which one's not in it? Nazareth. Nazareth. So do you think uh, Nazareth didn't really hold a high regard? amongst uh, the Jews and the leaders? Well, what good can come out of Nazareth? Exactly. Uh, and the Talmud. You guys remember what the Talmud is that I mentioned? That was the oral traditions of the elders outside of Scripture that Jesus oftentimes condemned them for and called them hypocrites because many times they would hold up their own traditions over Holy Writ. And so in the Talmud, 63 cities are mentioned. Which one do you think is not mentioned? Nazareth. Nazareth. 
So Nazareth, brethren, was not mentioned, which shows the little regard that it was given. Mary was, in, we also know that Mary was engaged to Joseph. And in that engagement, it's called the betrothal. And that betrothal is kind of like uh, us. You know, when, when I asked my wife to marry me and she said, yes, we were engaged. engaged. And yet the betrothal is very different than just an engagement. Because in Jewish marriage, there was uh, basically two stages. And in these two stages, we see uh, the first uh, was a commitment ceremony called the betrothal. And in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was, fo was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. What does it mean, before they came together? Huh? Before they consummated. Before they consummated. Before they came together sexually, she was found to be with child. And so we look at this, and then you get to, uh, to uh, the next point. Then sometime later, after an agreed upon time, which was usually after the, you had the ceremony, <clears throat> you're betrothed, then usually after an agreed upon time, which was usually a year, uh, then the actual marriage ceremony would come, and that's when they would consummate the marriage. Okay? But what's the point? The first ceremony of the betrothal was legal. So in order, if me and Christy, you know, we get engaged and uh, before we get married and you just, we, you know, there's some problems or some things we can't agree upon and we say, you know what, it's better just to separate now. We can both go our separate ways. Do I got to go to the courts? Do I got to get a lawyer? Do I got to do anything? No, we just go our separate ways. But in the Jewish system, this, the betrothal ceremony, even though the marriage hasn't been consummated yet, was legally binding. And he would have had to have written her a certificate of, of divorce in order to send her away. And so that's something that we have to, to understand, that the, the betrothal was legally binding between the, the groom and the bride. Uh, we also know that uh, that explains uh, why J uh, Joseph found himself in a predicament. Because if, if you have your, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1 for a second. When you look at Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18 and 19, we see here that, that Joseph, he's, He's, he's struggling as to what to do with this knowledge, right? Because as, as I said a moment ago, it, it'll tell us in verse 18 that she is found to be with child. And in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, notice what it says. Now the birth of Jesus Christ, as I said a moment ago, was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to, betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband... Remember, just betrothed, but still legally her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. Well, that's important because, brethren, not only is, the, is, it le is, he, is she legally bound to him and vice versa, we also need to understand that the angel told Mary, uh, as, you, as you study this further, that his name would be Jesus. And so she's now pregnant with this child. Joseph plans to send her away secretly. The angel tells her that his name is going to be Jesus. What does the name Jesus mean? Say again. In, yes, Joshua is transliterated. Yep, Joshua. Messiah. Huh? Messiah. It means Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. So Jesus literally means, the name literally means Jehovah saves. Who is Jesus again? The Son of God. He's the son of God. What does John chapter 1 tell us? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So we know that Jesus is the incarnate God, right? Jesus is God and man all at the same time. And we know that it says that Jehovah saves. What did Jesus do? He gave his life on the cross to save all mankind. Is Jesus the fulfillment of his name? Did his life show that he was the fulfillment of the, the definition of what his name is. Yeah. And so we look at this, this information. And that comes by way of Matthew 1 and 21, where it says, You will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So you think about Mary, and you think about Zacharias, you think about these two announcements. Unlike Zacharias, Mary knew that it was going to happen, but she did wonder how it was going to happen. And so in Luke 1, 34 and 35, remember what she said. Mary said to the angel, how can this be? Since I am a virgin. 
You see, the difference in the questions is what? Zechariah asked for what? Proof. He asked for proof. And he says, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to make you mute. And you won't be able to speak for a time. Mary didn't ask for proof. She just asked a logical question. Why was her question different? She accepted what was true. Go ahead. Yeah, it wasn't trying to validate Gabriel or God. It was yeah. just trying to validate science. <laughs> right. Yeah, trying to validate science. Yeah. Hey, I understand what you're saying. But I'm a virgin. And I don't know any other virgins that have babies. So how exactly is this going to happen? I mean, that's what you call a logical question. It wasn't doubt. It's kind of like confirming science, right? And she says, I've never been with a man. And so we know that the angel in verse 35 answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And so we also look at in the last uh, point um, is that, well, one of the last points is that the virgin birth of Jesus really is beyond our comprehension to understand. And it is important for us to accept it by faith. Why do I say that? The virgin birth is beyond our really uh, ability to understand, to really fully understand, in that we have to accept it by faith. Why do I say that? Because no other way you can conceive a child except through the male, female coming together. And that's real. Right? And that's scientifically accurate. But it's You think about 4,000 years have gone by. How many virgins uh, had a baby because the Holy Spirit of God had come upon them? So do you see why this is a very strange thing? It's why something you have to accept by faith. What does it mean to accept something by faith? What do you guys always hear me say biblical faith is? Belief, trust, and obedience. You have to believe the word of God. That's brought to you by the angel. You have to then trust that God is able to do what he says he will do. Right? Didn't, Zach, uh, didn't Zacharias and, uh, and, uh, uh, just have this conversation? Didn't Abraham and Sarai have this, or Abram and Sarai have that conversation? Uh -huh. that? Uh, knowing that they would have all known the old law and come out of that, wouldn't there have been some kind of anticipation on everybody's part that this was going to happen someday? Yeah, I mean, it was prophesied, and uh, I think it's all the way back in Isaiah chapter 7, I believe it was. So they, were, they were anticipating this. They should have been, right? But they should have been anticipating a lot of things, right, that they didn't necessarily anticipate. It's kind of like Stephen mentioned earlier. Why was it that one of God's priests, why was it that he didn't know his own history? When he told them that he was going to have a baby, and he knows he's old, well, guess what? Your wife's not the first old lady in the scriptures that had a baby. Because is there anything, <coughs> anything too powerful for God to do? It's, if we don't have the faith in God that he can save, our, save us from our sins, how can we not have faith in God that he can, that a virgin can deliver a baby. Yep. That's that's the key. That's we have to the virgin birth is the keystone. That's that's the most important part because without the virgin birth yep. we don't have the church. Well you think about the virgin birth too. I mean also a, a few more points and then Steve will finish his points next week. Um, <coughs> we're gonna run out of time here in about two minutes. The virgin birth is important. Why? Well, first and foremost, since the New Testament teaches that the virgin birth of Jesus, uh, denying the virgin birth would involve the denial of the inspiration of the scriptures. To deny the virgin birth would be to deny the inspiration of scripture. All scripture is in what? God breathed. God breathed. Inspired by God. Profitable for teaching, for rebuke, for training up in righteousness. So the man of God may adequately be equipped. 
Uh, number two, since the virgin birth was an essential part of God becoming flesh, denying the virgin <coughs> birth really essentially denies Jesus' deity. Do you understand that? To deny the virgin birth is to really deny the deity of Jesus Christ. Because he is the son of God. We know that uh, the virgin birth is tied with Jesus being God. Denying the virgin birth denies the value of Jesus' death. Because could, could any just mortal die for the sins of all mankind? Could any other sinful mortal die, uh, mortal die for the sins of all of us? No. Only God in his being, uh, be, only God putting on flesh, living amongst us, living a perfect sinless life, the, the pure lamb of God went to the cross and made a one-time eternal sacrifice for all of mankind, for the past, present, and future sins of, its, of God's creation. We know, brethren, that uh, since the virgin birth, it was the first of the miracles in which Jesus' life, um, de and denying the virgin birth, re renders one incapable of accepting the other miracles. If you deny the virgin birth, then how can you possibly accept any and all of the other miracles? At the end of John's Gospel, he says, if I was to write all the things that, that I knew Jesus to do, that I seen and that I heard and that I, I witnessed, if I was to write about all of it, he goes, I suppose not even the world could contain the amount of books that could be written. So, but if you go all the way back to the beginning and you deny Jesus, you deny his, his miraculous virgin birth, <coughs> it's as if you denied his deity, and it's as if you can't also then accept his sacrifice. You either believe some of scripture, what do I always say, or you or believe none of it. You get the final word. Is that considered blasphemy in the Holy Spirit? No. No. And we, we, I've done some uh, classes on that, but essentially, well, I guess actually in a way it could be actually blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Because blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is simply when you reject uh, the teachings and you reject what you see with your eyes, meaning that God, uh, the Holy Spirit, was working with Christ throughout his ministry. What came upon Jesus as he came up out of the water? When he came out to the world, and the heavens opened up, and God said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit descended upon him and stayed with him. So to deny Christ and to deny all of his teachings was to, was to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And that's what the blasphemy was. So let's uh, end it here because I know we're about a few 30 seconds beyond. So we'll pick this back up with uh, part three, and then you'll get into starting into the class next week. Yeah. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we are so blessed and so thankful that we have this opportunity to come together to study your word, to study out the history of your word, and to try to have a deeper, fuller understanding with the express purpose, Father, that we could take this information and share it. Share it with friends. Share it with family members. Share it with other church members. Father God, I pray that as we look to, to not only uh, remember these things, I pray that you give us the ability to, but I also pray that you give us the courage to take this message out to, to all we come in contact with, to help people to have a deeper, better understanding of who you are and the events that led up to, um, uh, to, the, to the coming of the Christ and, and what that means for the world. Father God, we pray that as we get ready to enter into worship here, that our worship is acceptable in your sight. We pray, Father, that, uh, that, that each of us, I pray that each of us will set aside the cares of the world and that we focus in as we all worship you here this morning, as you are the, the, we have an audience of one. Father God, we know just how uh, grateful we are for all your love and your grace, your mercy, your blessings. Father, thank you for all that you do for each of our families. We know, Father, that we have those that are on our prayer list and that are struggling at this time, and we pray a special blessing on each of them as they would have need, whether it be physically, uh, physical illnesses, uh, emotional uh, trauma or stress that they're dealing with, financial problems. Father, whatever it may be, whatever it may be, I pray that you would bless each of them that are on our prayer list as they would have need. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. <coughs> There was one more thing I wanted to get. So next week you'll pick up... Uh